Welcome to Whitetail Rendezvous Podcast. This is Bruce Hutchin, host and executive producer. Each week you will hear tips, techniques, strategies, and personal stories from some of the best and funniest whitetail hunters in North America. Hope you enjoy today's episode. If you do, tell a friend on social media. If not, tell me and I'll make it better. Thanks for listening, folks. Hey, folks, we got a new sponsor. It's called Buckwild Coffee. What's so special about Buckwild Coffee? Well, a gazillion people go to Starbucks every day and drink coffee. Well, why shouldn't Buckwild Coffee offer you light, medium, or dark roast with free shipping? All you have to do is go to whitetailrendezvous.com, go to shop, and order your coffee, and I'll ship it out for free. Hey, thanks so much for visiting Buckwild Coffee. The best brew in the West, the best brew around the campfire, the best brew in the hunting shack, the best brew anywhere. Buckwild Coffee. Get yours today. This is Whitetail Rendezvous, episode number 404. On today's show, we welcome Sean Bailey, host of Game On, Prep the Plate. What's so important about this show? Well, if you like cooking wild game, all sorts of wild game, you're going to get some culinary delights and culinary recipes that you can duplicate in your own home. Sean's more than just a cook, and his show is found on the Food Channel for the last couple of years. But Sean brings humor, laughter, and more than anything else, he brings the hunting tradition. So listen up. Find out all about Sean Bailey's hunting tradition. Welcome to a unique and exciting episode of Whitetail Rondo. Why is it unique and exciting? Well, this is Sean Bailey, host of Game On, Prep to Plate, of Seen on the Food Channel, is is my guest today. And the thing that I like about Sean in the warm-up, we were we were talking about why he got invited on hunting trips early on. And Sean, why don't, why don't we just jump into the show right there and go from go from here? You go on. Hi, Bruce. Hi, everybody. Yeah, we were talking about that. You know, I thought I was a good hunter. All my friends would invite me to go on all these hunting trips. Turns out I'm just a very good cook. So uh, they enjoyed my company as well as my cooking. So that's how we got started. Did a lot of traveling. My friend Fred, we did some Idaho hunting, some Colorado, mostly Pennsylvania hunting, though. That's what we like to do. Yeah, you said you're from Central PA, and, you know, um, whitetail hunting is huge, you know, in Pennsylvania, no doubt. Is that where you first started or cut your teeth, It's so to speak, on, on venison? Or were there, oh, other, yes. were there other game animals that you, that you started to um, get notable uh, reviews on? Uh, as far as... Cooking wire, yeah. just getting into the, getting into it. We started with venison because that is the most uh, widely sought after in Pennsylvania. A lot of people have venison. We notice they make jerky, sausage, and uh, you know hamburger, but they don't really know how to make anything really special with it. So that was the concept. Got the show going. Was you know what? We can make some gourmet meals out of this because it's really delicious. It's healthy. You just got to know how to cook it. And uh, we have a saying: you don't have to kill it twice because people overcook it. Because I think it's a wild game. And the only thing wild about it is it was out in the woods. It's nothing wild. It's the same food you're going to get. You just got to have some techniques so you don't dry it out. Yeah, you think about that. And I think about the early days. And as we showed in the warm up, um, you know, we used to, you know, uh, hunt in Wisconsin and um, we used to do drives. And, and we would come, literally come back, whatever deal we killed that day, we'd hang them up in the bar, uh, in the barn. Pardon me. We did go to bars, but That's we, were, right. <laughs> we were in the barn. And then, I mean, it was all hands on deck. And those deer, they they would hang and they'd bleed them out. And all of a sudden, they're they're wrapped and, and some are heading to the smoker. Some are, you know, going to the to the freezer. And other, right. other pieces are going to, um, you know, friends and neighbors. I mean, I couldn't right. believe how quick they processed, you know, uh, the whitetail. And... You know, everybody had their favorite recipes, and so on um, the next day or whatever, we'd have we'd have a feast. I mean, it was just unbelievable. And then we're talking twenty to thirty people, you know. Right. And you share your harvest. You're right. And if you have time, if you have enough deer, the best thing is aging venison. That that's the best thing you do to make more tender and bring out that full flavor. That's one thing we. I mean, and growing up too, back 
when I was, I guess, the 80s and I was a young kid, there really wasn't a lot of deer. So we did a lot of rabbit hunting, pheasant hunting, um, and different stuff. We trapped and everything, too. We didn't eat them. Uh, but it wasn't until later the deer population picked up a little better. And uh, we really started, you know, focusing on venison as well at the camp. And my camp is in Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania. And that's where I learned from my grandfather and my dad. My uncles, we all cook. And that's where, you know, you look up to them. And that's, that's how I got to start cooking is at the camp. My grandfather and uncles. You know, and I was going to ask you about the honey tradition, and and you just start talking about that. So let's let's segue into the honey tradition. One, the honey part, and then of course uh, everybody in camp was cooking. So you know you were expected to do the dishes and stuff like that. But you picked up and fill the beers. That was my my main job was fill the beers and do the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> well, how about killing the deer though? Let's talk about the honey tradition. How that was, you know, a big part of your family's lives. My uncles and that, they, I mean, at the time, there's a lot of kids. That was a big thing. Get into it, and we're losing that because kids aren't really going out in the woods anymore. They're playing their video games, but I wouldn't trade it for anything. You know, growing up, going out with your uncles and your grandfather, like you said, putting on drives, maybe seeing deer, but just the point is being out there. And I more remember rabbit hunting because there's more of a chance you can get a rabbit than a deer. And the best thing they preached was safety was always the first number one step on it. And then always utilize what you get. Don't just kill stuff. Stuff. Make sure you know you're going to use it and uh, and cook it. And that's you know you don't kill stuff just to kill it. And I can't. You took care of it and you ate it. And that's basically how we got started. So back then, if if you can remember, you know, because um, we didn't have computers for cookbooks and everything. How did they hand down the recipes? Little. In fact, I still have notes from my dad and my grandfather in my recipe book. Just trial and error. They'd write down a little bit each time. Uh, like their sausage or smoked sausage, how long to smoke it, uh, what woods, uh, apple wood, hardwood. Uh, actually, grapevines is good to smoke meat, too. But they're all hand little notes handed down, and I, I use them a lot on the show. Uh, I just lost my dad here in December, but I used to call him all the time for recipes. He'd go through, use modern technology, take a picture of an email at me. <laughs> but uh, still, those, those little hand notes are still going around. Yeah, and those are family treasures uh they really are because you know you can't replicate that 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 becomes part of the hunting tradition a lot of people think we just go out and and shoot stuff but our whole life uh is around the hunting tradition where you're talking and we're going to spend most of the time talking not about harvesting gear but what happens when that venison's on the ground or that rabbit or squirrel or grouse you're right um you know and i love the fly fish so you got you got brook trout in all oh, yes. types of things. Then, then we get into duck hunting and goose hunting. I mean, it doesn't end, does it? No. In summers, fishing pretty much. Yeah. And then it goes. It can go year round. You're right. And if you uh, preserve it, that's the other thing we do. We go through preserving techniques. Oh, for the freezer, like with our foraging and that too. We, it's you know, prepare it, take care of it, and you can enjoy it all year long if you take care of it right. So let's go. I know I'm starting to salivate because I want to. I want to hear some of your recipes and some of your techniques. So let's just kind of walk through. Um, we're in the woods and and it's grouse season, and we put a couple of grouse in the in the in the in the bag. So now we're bringing them home. What are we going to do with those grouse to prepare them for for the crew so we can have a nice little meal with some you know with some wine and some good veggies right. and a nice salad. How's that going to work out? Well, first thing you do is, is I don't like the fact when people get a, an animal like a pheasant or a grouse, if you will. I like to dress it out as quickly as I can, get all the inners out so it doesn't taint the meat, and let it cool down. I put a little stick in there. As I'm carrying it around in my backpack, I let it air out. I don't want all that heat in there. Um, I leave the feathers on because you know, it protects it, keeps it clean. When I get back, usually it's just the breast and the legs. Um, I like to debone the breast. And uh, one of my favorite ways is, is um, I'll butterfly them open, stuff them with roasted red pepper, um, some basil, maybe some mozzarella, salt and pepper, close it up and just put it in the oven. Um, not to overcook because there's no fat on it. You're going to cook it at high temperature and relatively shortly, like eight to ten minutes, depending on the thickness of it. Uh, then I put a little mozzarella on top and serve it with some red sauce. It's really good. Okay, so we go back. So you, you take the feathers off, you, you've got the the wings and um yeah i mostly the skin them i i don't pluck because that's okay. a lot of work i usually just skin them out okay and then wash them out uh but i like to dress them out um 
I like to bleed them out too, uh, but unfortunately they're already taken care of when you got but when you got them out and pull the innards, and then I just put a stick in there, let air go through it, it airs it out. When I get back, I'll just skin it out and just take the legs and the breast off. Okay. Pretty easy. So you just um, cut the breast away from the bone. Then you said about stuffing. So you take the left and right side of the breast and then you, yep. you just, do you sew it together or do you wrap it with something or? Well, if you, um, first of all, you're going to eat it right off the bat, but I also like to soak them in salt water a little bit to draw out some of that blood, at least for a little bit. And uh, of course you want to go through and make sure the BBs are out because I'm not as good a shot as you are. <laughs> but while I do that, I pull it off the bone and I have a nice little uh, boneless uh, breast, if you will. And I butterfly it open. Uh, I sort of fillet it so just like a sandwich. And you open it up, and then you salt and pepper it, and that's where you put your, your stuffing, the, the uh, roast red peppers, basil, mozzarella. Then you close it back down, and you can eat it in the oven. I like grilling it, too, which adds another uh, another taste factor in it. But when you flip it, just make sure you flip it closed in, if you know what I mean. You, you don't cut it the whole way through, so there's like a backing, like a book. Just keep flipping it that direction. That way all the stuff on the inside won't come out. Now, if you're not good at flipping, you can put a toothpick in it until it's done, and that'll hold it together as well. Ah, okay, the old toothpick trick. Because I, I was visualizing, and I wish, is that on your YouTube channel, or could somebody, if they wanted to see that, could, would that be on the food channel? We have a pheasant recipe that has it on it, and it's, that recipe will be on the food channel, yes. Okay, so while we're talking about that, if it's... And it's a pheasant al monte, it's another another recipe too which is basically you butterfly the pheasant completely open after you uh pluck it and then you sear it in a cast iron skillet and then you flip up a slime breast down and i put a himalayan salt block on top of it and put it in the oven 450 degrees and it's nice it real crispy it's sort of like it's deep fried but it's not that's you'll find that recipe for pheasant as well in there which you can also do with a grouse let's talk about how people can can get a hold of you or, or check out yourself. We already mentioned the food channel. So, you know, just yep. give us a primer of where you can be found in the digital world. Sure. We have a website, which is gameoncooking.com. We, uh, you can search us on Facebook, which is uh, Game On Prep the Plate in 30 Minutes. You'll see a, a round guy with a black hat. That's me. Um, we are on, as you said, the, the, the food channel. And we're also Bonko TV. If you want to see our full episodes, Bonko TV is sort of like a Netflix. It's a free television uh, sort of app for your for your TV. And we have probably six full episodes on there. Now, the rest, the Food Channel, are like one or two minutes with recipes. But Bonko's, Food Channel, Facebook, and our website's best way to get a hold of us. Now, spell Bonko, please. Bonko. B-O-N-K-O. I didn't know it was going to have a spelling test. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I didn't want to get it wrong. So somebody, yes. you know, I'd rather be, um, I, I like the people because I've had a lot of people say, hi, now, how did you spell that? Because I couldn't yep. understand what you said, Bruce, on the show. I go, okay, fine. Yep. It's so, Bonko TV, like Roku. It'll be on the Roku um, app where you get on the TV or smart right. TVs without the Bonko. Okay, great. And the Food Channel have a link to go right over to it. So now, okay, so we got the rough grouse. Now we're going we're gonna to hunt some venison. So we've got a buck or doe down. And what happens right. once it's on the ground? Okay, it's dead. It's there. Now we're going to get it from the field to the plate. Right. And I was taught, we were at a, um, a deer farm last year, and he taught me a great, a really good example how to preserve the meat when you got it. You got to bleed them out because if you shoot one with a bow, it basically bleeds itself out. But with a gun, it's the blunt force that kills it. So when you get up on it, what he did, he says, this looks a little mean. He, he sliced the juggler, and he used his foot to pump on a chest to get, he had to get at least two or three gallons of blood out of the neck. And that's what makes that neck meat taste not as good as the rest. You know, you get the blood out first, then you got to get the heat out. That's the two main things you want to get out. So once you bleed it out, then you can dress it, pull the innards out, and, uh, you know, try to try to let it cool down. Even put a stick in there, let some air flow through, depending on the temperature where you're at. But that bleeding is really important for uh, keeping the fresh meat, and it, it really affects the taste. I really do believe that. Okay, so just to recap. So you harvest the, the game, you get up, you find it, and it's what you've learned recently, he just cuts the juggler and then actually forces um, the blood out yeah. through through the cut uh, in the juggler vein. Is that correct? He actually takes his foot and actually sort of like a, an air pump, and it pumps on the chest. and 
It sounds a little cruel and humane, but what you want to do, you want to utilize this deer as much as you can. So you want it to taste good. And it's already passed, so you're not hurting it or anything. But use your foot to pump like an air pump, and you'll actually see the blood. It's it's literally a gallon or two come out of the neck, and which, which sits in there and I think makes the taste a little gamey. But, yeah, just pump it with your foot, and you'll see it come out. Then you move it, and then you dress it out. That's when you pull the innards out. And you, as we say, we got it out in the field. Field dress it. Right. And one thing that I've noticed hunting as I, I do in the Rockies in for elk, elk are, are big critters. Oh, yes. But we, we take them apart. We, we get the hide off them because it could be below zero. And if you leave that hide on them, you've insulated that meat and it keeps the meat warm and not cold. So one of the first things we do, we get the hide off um, and then we get we get the blood out. But I never have seen people do that with whitetails. Um, even even in the archery seasons, you know, they just they just gut it out and then they'll drag it out or put it in the ATV now or, or truck or tractor or whatever. But, you know, would that same thing that we do with elk, getting the hide off right away, make it taste better? Um, I, it probably could. I mean, if you put in the um, – what's the white bags you use? I, I'd have the experience at elk once, but you take the – You put bag. the quarters in the – Yeah, the what's game bag. Game bag, yeah. As long as you put it in and keep the flies off it. Um, a lot of people keep the, the hide on it so they can age it. They'll hang it because archery and rifle season will be, you know, in the 40s, and that's okay to hang outside to age it. Um, but if you quarter it, if you put it in a cooler in a refrigerator and, and age it in that bags, I see no problem at all. In fact, it could it could help the flavor. But there's secrets to flavor too, though. <laughs> um, and a lot of restaurants do it. But if you get a real gamey piece of, of venison, if you just soak it in milk, there's a uh, acid in the milk that fights the bacteria, which causes that gamey taste. And I'm let's let's say you get a buck that's in the rut. You really can't do too much. It's going to taste a little different. But if you just soak that thing in milk for about 20 minutes to an hour, it'll have a complete different flavor. It takes that gaminess right out of it. A uh, uh, gentleman, when I first started hunting uh, Wyoming on antelope, because they eat sage, and basically that that's what they eat. And the first antelope, I go, this doesn't taste so good. So. That's exactly what he did. He said, okay, just take your cuts of meat and, and put it in, in milk, and, and then it'll, you know, do what you said. There's something with enzymes and all this other stuff. Right. The, there is the a acidity. scientific reasoning behind it. I don't know that. I just right. know it makes it taste better. Right. It makes it taste better. But so those are little tips, folks, that, um, you know, are passed down. We talked about the hunting tradition, but you get things passed down by the elders, and um, they work because yep. they didn't like eating gamey meat either. No, and that's why uh, that actually tip was handed down by my grandfather. So I know it works. It was by by tradition. I got it on on my on my show here. Okay, so we got the we got the white tail at home, and now we're gonna we're gonna make our cuts. What's your favorite cut uh, off a of white tail? Well, the the back strap is always you know one of the easiest and probably the best cuts. Um, but you know what? And that's the other thing. I, I do my own butchering, and there's a guy named Scott Ray. He's on YouTube, an English guy. He's over in the UK, a friend of mine. He went over and showed a different butchering technique where it's very low hamburger, because let's face it, we make a lot of burger and steaks and roast is what you can make at home. But he shows step-by-step step, like how to make a, uh, a standing rib roast, uh, steaks, uh, and all the different cuts. Granted, the deer are a lot smaller in England, but if you get a small whitetail, it would work just as good. I highly recommend people to check him out. Scott Ray, R-A-E, and a really good guy. And he does a lot of wild game cooking over there. So that's how we got connected. So w when you take the bass trap up, are you just butterflying them and putting them in your secret sauce and, and grilling them? Or how, do, how does that come from, from the ground, you know, from the harvest to the plate? Right. Well, if I can age it while it's sitting, while it's, while it's hanging, if the weather provides it, I'll let it hang. And for at least you know, four or five days, um, until we get the enzyme breaking out. We did a show with a gentleman close to here, and he ages venison and beef in his refrigerator for 32 days at 32 t degrees. And oh, it's, like, it's like butter. It, it is so delicious. You wouldn't believe it. But for me, I would cut it out, and either I would age the strip itself, but if it's already aged, I would, I would cut it out, pull off that uh, the purple skin, and I would stake it out. But I like ham uh, big cowboy cuts. I don't like little thin... Uh, steaks, you can do more with them when they're thicker, plus they'll freeze better and they'll hold better in your refrigerator. 
and I'm a very big believer in vacuum sealing. I do a lot of vacuum sealing with a lot of my venison, and I'll just stake it out, uh, three or four in each one, cowboy cut, no two inches thick, and that's the best way I like. Okay, so, and that'll stay if you vacuum, um, um, wrap them or, or freeze them, so right. you take the vacuum. We used to do that on all our fish. I used to fish out of San Diego and catch tuna, and you know, a hundred pound tuna is a lot of a lot of tuna. Oh, yes, and and so we'd share it with the neighbors and everything, but we we vacuum it because it would last a long time. Right now, long time's a relative term. As far as the whitetail, what's the length of um, the meat will stay great uh, vacuum sealed? I've never really lasted that long because I usually eat it before the summertime. Uh, but within a year, you probably want. And plus, I think it's Pennsylvania law. You have to have the deer from last year out of your freezer before you put a new one in. So I don't want to get in legal trouble. So I'm going to go on a year there, Chris. <laughs> okay. Uh, but you know what? If, if you can't afford a vacuum freezer, a uh, vacuum pump, um, if you double Ziploc them, put them in one Ziploc, squeeze all the air out. So you have like a sandwich bag with a couple steaks in it. Then put them in a, a gallon Ziploc and squeeze the air out. That double plastic will protect it just as much. So not everyone has a vacuum packer. So that's tips we like to show too. We break it down. Here's one way to do it. Here's the other way, and here's the third way. So if you take it, one Ziploc bag, put the steaks in it, squeeze the air out, take that and put a couple in the, the gallon bag, it will last a lot longer as well. It's the it's the ice crystals that break down to give the you know the frostbite taste. Right, and I knew a guy that figured out with his with his handy vac, he he made his own vacuum sealer. Oh. I'm going okay, but it worked. Yep, it's just getting the air out of the bag is all the vacuum sealer is. Yeah. And it, and it worked. And we found out, too, if you're going to store your meat, well, just another tip, don't put it in your refrigerator freezer because that has a defrosting cycle. So it heats up and cools down, which produces ice crystals. Deep freezer, it lasts for a year, not as much in a regular freezer if you don't have one. But that's another tip. If you're going to store it for a while, put it in a chest freezer, a stand-up freezer, where it's a steady cold temperature. It's not heating up or cooling down. That'll last you a lot longer, too, and keep it better tasting. Now, my jerky... I, I just put that in bags and keep it. Now, what about the summer sausage and my heat em ups? I call heat em ups, you know, the kielbasa and yep. all those. Uh, talk to me about when you're making that up. How long will that stay uh, in your freezer? That uh, we, uh, what me and my brother do once a year, we'll do and make 100 pounds of smoked venison sausage. You go to our camp, it's a full week in an event, and we smoke it. The techniques that my grandfather, my dad taught me. And then uh, we'll smoke for probably three or four hours, rotating them through and keep the fire about one, 110. We just want to smoke it. We don't cook it. So it sort of preserves it. Um, that's also stuff in the casings and everything. That's why it takes a full weekend. Uh, but we'll take it out, uh, take several servings wrapped in saran wrap, and then put the saran wrap in the gallon bag and zip it. I've never really had mine frostbitten. It's been probably a year. I usually eat it pretty quickly. Um, but they last, especially... Use a little bit of curing salt when you're mixing, uh, which will help it preserve. But as far as the flavor, uh, with the casing and everything, I just use a natural casing. I always like the natural casing better than the artificial. It tends to taste better, and it doesn't get that freezer burn as quick. But that's just my personal opinion. So, folks, I hope you're taking uh, notes. And um, like all my podcasts, you can you, you can hear it basically forever until the digital world goes away. But um, – you know, this is going to be a, a great show to come back and say, oh, what did he say about that? And, and how did that work? And so let's, let's, uh, also up. Bruce, I'm very reachable. If they get on Facebook or they message me, I get back to a lot of my fans. And in fact, I just had a fan this past week who was uh, fighting cancer for the second time. And he was a morale hunter, mushroom hunter, and he couldn't go out anymore. So he just went to where he could get them. I just happened to meet him down the town. I took him out as he was going in for his treatment. Give him a big bag of mush, big bag of mushrooms. It's a relationship I like to keep with my fans. Now I can't bring you all mushrooms, but we can answer <laughs> questions if you get a hold of us. So I'm very reach out, very very. How can I put it? You can get a hold of me easily. Yeah, it's just like uh, one big family, and I I call it you know around the campfire we all reach common ground, and it could be the shack. Uh, you're you know, right around the table that's been there for 50 years and it's got everybody's you know initials and the notches from the gin rummy games or cribs games or whatever um you know and that's the thing about you know the hunting tradition and families you know 
the things I talk about, I've been there and done it. And you see generations come up and then you talk about uh, handing down the recipes. Um, you know, that's one thing I just love about our hunting tradition, which non-hunters don't get. Um, your thoughts right. on that? Traditions, you know, it's really big. Um, and I think kids are losing out uh, by not doing the things that we're doing. And it's an interaction between your elders. And I don't think kids are getting it anymore. Um, and I guess your memory of your taste, when you can make the same thing your grandfather made, and it reminds you of all the times back when you had the time with them, it really makes it much more special. And, of course, you tweak a little bit yourself, put some you know, hotter peppers and that in there. But the basis of that flavor still comes from the love and the, you know, the memories and tradition you had growing up, which I think really, really adds to it. Now, tell me about the Eastern Waterfowl Festival, the Mediterranean Grilled Goose. Now, let's talk about that recipe. One, yes. did you have to kill the goose? Actually, um, that's a funny story. We, uh, we need the goose to practice. So we actually did film an episode of Hunting Goose. And uh, my the producer set it up and everything, and the guy let me use his Benelli, which is a beautiful gun. And we're sitting in the uh, next to the pond and everything, and here comes these geese, and I jump up, and I'm so used to a pump. I jump up, I miss the first shot, and that's on video of me trying to pump a Benelli. So, <laughs> 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 it was a very funny scene. I even had to laugh at myself. Uh, but luckily, that worked out. Shooters. Oh, <laughs> after that, it worked out all right. We we did get seven to practice on. And growing up, I never hunted geese. I never had personally a good a good goose recipe. So I asked a lot of different people, you know, how do you make the goose? We all heard about the goose and the, the cedar plank board, right? That recipe mm-hmm. where you, 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 you spice it, you take your time, you put it in wine overnight. Whitetail Rondo is pleased to announce a partnership with GoHunt.com. Who's GoHunt.com? Well, if you're a DIY hunter, you need the information at GoHunt.com forward slash insider. Why? Because it provides 4,200 profiles, every unit, every species, and every season. Furthermore, they give in-depth analysis, interactive maps, unit access, and seasonal trends. Draws are very important, and they give you the most accurate information in the business. All this is available when you go to GoHunt.com forward slash Insider. Make sure you use promo code WR when you join Insider. You'll get a $50 gift card for GoHunt.com gear shop. All in all, if you're hunting out west in 2018, GoHunt.com Insider is where you need to be to get all the research information. When you use promo code WR, Whitetail Ronimu receives a small commission from GoHunt.com. Right, you put it on a cedar board, cook it real slow for four hours, take it off, throw the goose away and eat the board. That, that's pretty much what goose was for me in the beginning. But I needed to make a good recipe for this waterfowl convention. So we took these seven geese we had, and I went from different marinades. The guide says soak in cola, like Coca-Cola. Uh-huh. That the game this out. It was good. Left a little sweet for me because I, I was going to grill it. It had to be prepped to play in 30 minutes. So I was going to grill it, so I needed to cook it fast and not slow and long where it fell apart. Um, the other thing was um, salt water. And the best thing I came up with was that back to milk. Milk just made it taste absolutely delicious. So I, I soak it overnight in milk. I also butterfly that open. And then because goose is really, really tough. So you have to tenderize it. So I... You can either be with a hammer, but I have a nice little tenderizer, which has all these blades that separate the fiber to make it really you know, chewable. And at that point, I did a sautéed spinach with um, a cream cheese and chive mixture. And then, then I put that on a outside grill with a smoke, and it really added a great flavor. We were handing it out. People would have swore it was steak. I actually had a vegetarian come back and ask for a second one We were when we were putting out this recipe. But uh, it's a very, very simple recipe. Uh, the milk really helps it be edible. Um, that takes care of the gaminess, the roughness, the, 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 uh, to make it tender. You butterfly it open and beat it up pretty good. And then you close it up, and it's really, it's a nice, nice flavor. I have to give In fact, I'd go on goose now again and not even think twice about it. Now, the legs, I never did anything with the legs because they're a little tough. Basically just breasted them out. But it was a great episode. We had them locking up on us coming in. Uh, we filmed, we got seven, but that show's going to come out here probably in the end of summer. You'll be able to see that on, on Bonco TV. But goose was hard. After this recipe, everyone was taking it and they're going to try it. So we were down to Maryland Waterfowl Convention. We did an outside cook and uh, we did what? 
five shows, five shows, and then it got a great response. And everyone says, "Oh, I don't like Goose," and we sort of forced on them. They ended up liking it, so it, it, it felt good to actually make something that good, and people appreciate it. Yeah, I've been. Um, I've had some great goose and i've had some not so goose and it's kind of like whitetails it depends what they're eating on same thing with elk same thing with any game animal that i've hunted depends what they uh, like cattle they finish them off right. well, what was you know what was the the main things that finished off that um that game animal before you harvested them and that made a lot of difference you know to me now what about like liver pate do you get into that um end of the end of the cooking not yet uh we're just trying to do the intro get everyone our fans into showing how you can cook a gourmet meal and show that it can be simple we're gonna go more advanced coming up after we get the you know the crowd to back us we don't want to start with something really difficult that way they won't be able to really follow us so our first couple of years it's going to be really fantastic recipes that are really quick and, and prep the plate in 30 minutes is our motto so that's what we're sticking at but no i haven't really dabbled in anything like that yet not saying we're not, though. Now, do you have some books out that people can go on and get a Kindle book, or or is it just all digital um, uh, video? It's all digital right now. Um, Throwing around the idea of uh, when I was younger, I wanted to make a book called Lazy Man's Cooking and Women Who Like to Cook Like One. So it'd be all some <laughs> recipes. Uh, it just, it's time to get it put down on the paper. And if we do a, a recipe book, it's going to be made for guys. It's going to have a lot of pictures in it and, and make you. it simple. Thank you. Oh, you need the pictures. Who likes reading when you can look at it? Uh, visual. Uh, guys are visual. Yes, uh, if I can make a smell of vision to come out of the book, I'd do that too, because that really adds to it. <laughs> well, no, you have to get those scratch things that they put the, you know, the perfume on. You have to scratch it. Then you can You're right, the scratch and sniffs. Exactly. There you go. There you go. There, so there's no, your tip for Whitetail Rendezvous for today. Yeah. Um, and no cookbook yet. Everything's digital, but it, it could be in the future. It all depends on how it works out. Oh, that's great. Now, of everything you've ever cooked, what is your favorite, your personal favorite that you and your wife and family sit down to and you just kill it? I mean, every time you eat it, you go, I can't believe this is so good. You know what? The one that uh, I was surprised it was big with my family and everything else is the one we our opening episode. We did a uh, venison wrapped in bacon stuff with jalapeno peppers, apples and garlic. I know of a, I do a lot of stuffing, but. Uh, that is probably my favorite to the point where my wife will even eat and she doesn't like venison and, uh, my daughter will eat it. And people who really don't, they turn their nose down to venison. They try it and say, wow, this is good. It's the idea is not overcooked. Um, it's, it's basically the back strap cut in a cowboy cut real thick. You want to, like I say, butterfly, the same thing as you see, you see the, uh, the, the play we go here. Then I, that's where I put the jalapeno pepper. But you take the seeds out and the veins, you don't want it hot. I just want the jalapeno flavor. So I de-vein it with a spoon, but make sure you wash your hands because you might find out later on if you rub your eyes or something, you wish you washed your hands. <laughs> uh, and then a very thin slice of apple to the point where the apple actually will melt. And then garlic, fresh garlic diced up. And then you put that in the middle. And when you're wrapping with bacon, I also found don't use good bacon. Uh, use the cheaper bacon stretches. And as you stretch it over, make a snowball and the bacon will contract. And it will hold that sting together as you're grilling it. And as you're flipping it, consider the steak having four sides. And once all four sides have crispy bacon, the middle is medium rare, medium well. It's right around medium, perfect perfect temperature for the for venison. Didn't over dry it. And also the bacon won't let it dry out. So it's like a, uh, I want to say guy proof, but I'm sure someone could screw, screw that up. But it's pretty easy, and it's probably one of my favorite to go to mills is that it's fry venison that's our first episode on bonka you can catch that up now are you you're grilling those um uh steaks the venison steaks are you grilling those or are you using a um a, a pan you know iron cast pan or? i cooked them in a cast uh cast iron skillet inside but when you're out in the bacon on the grill you got to be careful for flare-ups so you got to keep you can't just set it there and let it go um you got to keep flipping it but that all the grill adds a more of a smoky flavor uh, but for the show, we just did it in a cast iron skillet or any skillet and, uh, and just keep on rotating. And uh, that's the best way to do it as well. Well, it's a good way to do it. So we, we, we got the main course. Now, what do you show the you know, salads and, and the vegetables and all that? Talk to me about, okay, so we got to 
prime piece of venison wrapped in bacon, and it's just delicious. What else are we serving up with it? Uh, we serve it with a grilled romaine lettuce. Uh, you take lettuce, you drizzle some olive oil on salt and pepper and some spices, and then you just put it on indoor grill or outdoor grill for like, just till you get lines. You don't want to overcook it. Flip it, put some balsamic vinaigrette on it with some feta cheese and a little bit of, I'll show you how to make a nice little tomato flour on our episode so the guys can impress their women. Give them a, a tomato flour. Um, I also did a side of roasted red peppers and, I'm sorry, roasted red potatoes. And it's so simple, but so delicious. I just take the dry Italian salad dressing with olive oil, cut the, uh, the red potatoes in half, sprinkle it. Uh, then I put them on a bread pan on nonstick foil face down for like 20 minutes at about 350. And it caramelizes it. And man, that is just really, really a nice compliment. All three of them, the, uh, the roasted red potatoes, the grilled romaine salad, and then the venison makes a nice plate. And there's different colors, so it greens it up really nice, too. Now, are we, we having um, sourdough bread, any kind of roll um, with it? Or? We haven't showed how to make bread. That will be coming up because we do have some people who are going to show us how to make their own flour, which will be interesting. I'll probably be going how to make bread with yeast rising and everything. I have done it. Um, but no, no, no bread on this one. Now, what about dessert? Dessert? On the episode, I made a uh, homemade apple dumpling, which was handed out for my grandmother. Uh, but she made her own crust. And after Pillsbury came out with the dough crust, I could not put any more time into making the crust. It takes a long time. They, they mash it, to be honest with you. So I take the Pillsbury pie crust, and I cut it in quarters. So there's four pieces, and there's eight total. And I'll just make my pumpkin pie mixture, and I'll take a old Granny Smith apple, peel it and core it, put a pate butter on it, put it down, cover it with the... Uh, you know, the cinnamon, the sugar, the brown sugar, vanilla. Then just make a snowball out of it, put it in a pan. It's a perfect apple dumpling. Comes out great. I think Grandma might be upset and use her dough recipe, but she'll still be happy it came the way it comes out. It's actually really good with homemade whipped cream. You really can't go wrong with that. I was going to ask about the ice cream. So you like whipped cream better than the vanilla ice cream? Uh, I don't know if it's better. <laughs> it's good, though. If you can get homemade ice cream, it's even that tops it off, but... I just get heavy cream, put a little bit of uh, powdered sugar in it, and vanilla, and I whip it up, and it, it really, it's just, it's full flavored. I, I, I'm going to go with the whipped cream, definitely for that. Now, how about, are we drinking wine, or are we having a, a, a stout beer, or what are we drinking for beverage? Well, no, no. Sounds like we're in a nice date. I'm going to give you some wine, but I think we'll warm up with beer, because I'm a beer guy. But I think it goes great with a red wine, nice Merlot. So that's probably what I would go, but... It goes good with beer, too. Well, it depends if I'm in camp. You yes. know, um, I don't carry a lot of wine to camp, but you know, <laughs> beer goes with me. <laughs> we have an episode where my cousin actually makes wine, and he has, I want to say, 14 different variations of the berries he picks. A blueberry, huckleberry, strawberry, dandelion wine. And, uh, man, it is just a nice, uh, it's a sweeter wine. It's not like the, the real heavy wines, but, man, it is really good. And that's on one of our episodes as well interview him so that's part of our forging you know what you're picking these berries and everything and you make your own wine out of it so that's where we have wine at camp but we don't really take merlot or drink with the stem glasses or anything more shot glasses <laughs> <laughs> how about paper cups <laughs> yeah that works just the same yeah <laughs> it ain't cooth but it, it sure as heck works and there's no dishes to, there's no dish that goes in the fireplace you're absolutely right. It's it's with the company you're in. Now, if you're at home with the wife, you want a stem glass, I'd go with a nice Merlot. It can't. Oh. You just put the beer and the, the sweet wine out, and I've never had any leftovers, so I can't tell you what to do with leftovers. That's a good thing, right? Yeah. Yeah, we never have leftovers either at, at my house or at, at the camp. <laughs> That's for darn right. sure. So, I, again, um, game on from prep to plate in 30 minutes, and, and folks uh, – you know, Sean's got it down and he's got it down because he's a real guy. And we talk about this all the time on the show, real people in real places. And you, you heard some anecdotes of, of who he is. And it's just so neat to be able to, you know, talk to a guy that you'd be you'd walk into his camp or he'd walk into your camp and you'd say, what's, you know, what's for supper. And if out West, it'd be some kind of steak, you know, we'd, right. have, we'd have elk or antelope or mule deer or, we have white tail. You can have buffalo, um, and then you can you can keep going. We got a lot of stuff to eat out here. But, that's, um, 
that was one thing. My, I'm sorry. That was one thing. My grandfather's big at camp is, you know, party, have fun. But Sunday before the first day, he always wanted to have a sit down meal, bring everyone together. And we say grace that that was very important to him. In fact, you just brought that back to my memory. I think I'm going to start that tradition back up, sit down meal, sit around and like we were a family. So thanks for bringing that memory up. I appreciate that. <laughs> well, um, you know, I, I, I think of uh, two guys um, in my life, um, Otto Knight and, and Harry Shear. Otto Knight was back in New England. That's where I started off. And, and um, he, you know, he showed me how to rest my first rough grouse and, and squirrels and rabbits and stuff. And then Harry Shear got me hunting out west. And I think of those guys and, and the tradition that they instilled, I'm still I'm instilling that to all my grandchildren. And, right. and you share it. In, and it's just like in, in Europe. Uh, that they give them the, the they give respect to the animal they take uh, in Germany. That I can't say in German, but it's the right. last bite, uh, and and they just they honored honored the uh, the animals, and that's another thing that non hunters don't get that we actually honor that which we have that would uh, we have harvested, and then it's just the the traditions and the joy. You know, I I can sit and shut shut my eyes, and I can be back. You know, years and years ago in Union Center along the Baraboo River on the Rogers Farm and big plank tables and and we're eating, you know, Thanksgiving for, you know, for 20 or 30 with game and, and, and forage you right. know, from the farm. I mean, those memories are, are priceless to me. And I know I'm rambling on. But that's but, why it's important to us to make these memories to what kids do show up and you know, show them it is fun. And that's what's strange to me is, you know, I'm 48. I'm thinking back, wow, my dad was 48. I thought he was old, <laughs> and he wasn't. <laughs> but he was generating all these memories for us, and so now my nephews and that, they're looking up to us to generate the memories that our parents and my grandparents gave us. And it's and just as important to us as it is to them. I really believe that. Yeah, and the, the Native Americans I've spent time with, you know, the elders are revered. I'm truly revered. And, you know, people will sit and, and listen to the elders um, tell the stories and, and and share their lives and pass down these traditions. And, and unfortunately, today in our digital world, we are losing that. But then you start talking to a guy like you and you realize now that through his cooking, you mentioned the recipes was handed down from your grandfather. That's what, 50, 60, 100 years, years ago? I don't I don't know. You got to help me with the, the date line here. I'm sorry, what was that again? No, I'm thinking of the, the recipes that have been handed down to you. Are they 50 years old, 60 years old, 100 years old? Uh, they're older than me, so they're at least 48, uh, especially the sausage recipe. Um, yeah, I'd say some of them for, from my grandfather and his brother during the Depression. And one of the memories you're talking about, they're sitting around talking about is, is during the Depression, there was really not too much to eat. And my great uncle actually went hunting. And they got a, a nice bucket still mounted at our, at our camp with a 22. They hunted it down all day long till they got it. And they said that was, you know, the best thing they could did for their neighbors. Everyone else, they brought me, everyone had fresh meat for the week. But that's a story, that, you know, as we're sitting there, I just went back on that. You know, hunting is more than just getting out and killing, surviving. And it's, it's, it's tradition. And the stories, it's just amazing. The stories I heard growing up, we sit around our camp, we play guitar, we sing. And we tell stories, and I don't know if women will ever really get that. Do you think? No. no. I, I don't I mean I love our, our fans out there, but you know, hunting's a little different. You know, sitting around and not showering for days on end—it's fun to us, and we can't tell you why. No, dirt, dirt, and guys just go together. I mean, that's kind of women came from our rib, and all the rest. You know, all the all the rest. Um, um, you know that that's kind of how it went because you know i'm happy when i'm dirty and, yep. and muddy you know i didn't I'm, notice I'm, I'm dirty yeah. it's camouflage to me <laughs> <laughs> I, I think one of the, the biggest memories for me for hunting is with my grandfather uh his best friend is taught me to play guitar we're hunting rabbits and i got my first rabbit with the old beagle but the rabbit is right there and i'm so proud of my i think i got it at three feet as it was sitting there but i'm so proud that i got it but then we got back. My grandfather, he did, he treated me like it was the trophy. We got back to the camp and he hung it up, taught me how to skin it. We cooked it. And it was like it was like the trophy of the day. Sean got the rabbit. And uh, even though it wasn't that special, he made me feel extremely special. And that, that's probably one of my fondest memories of hunting with my grandfather is uh, getting back there. And he, no matter what fish he caught, no matter what animal, 
it was always special to him and special to you. And he always made you feel that way. And that, that'll always be in my heart. And I think to spread that love for the outdoors, we, it's up to us to do that now. And I'm doing it through cooking. You know, that's the best way. If I feed them, they'll listen to me longer, right? <laughs> yeah. And, and it, it, it uh, transcends um, belief systems. That we just want to leave it at that. People, like you said, um, you had a, vegetarian pure vegetarian came back and said can i have some more whatever that was yes and they had no idea they were eating you know they were eating um meat well they knew they were eating meat but they didn't realize it was that good they said well i'll try it and then they and uh she was very open which was nice you know most vegetarians are closed doors and everything and she said i wouldn't eat every day but she said it was very tasty and that was like wow there was also a chef there who could not believe that that was uh that was goose is not. Is this a steak? I'm like, I swear to, I swear it's not. It's goose. <laughs> that was another one that felt good. So, well, Sean, you know, um, I could go on for hours. One, because our 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 backgrounds are very similar. Um, we enjoy what we're doing, and I enjoy eating very well. Yes, and, me too. You know, I, I I enjoy eating a lot. Uh, I have eaten well a few times, but some of the best meals were in the mountains way away from civilization. And, you know, we got spring water and we've got uh, ribs or, or, or tenderloins or tongue or heart or whatever. And we're cooking it up and we're eating it. And, and, you know, the stars are out and it's just, you know, it doesn't get any better than that in, in my memory. And food is part of that. I right. guess that's what I'm trying to say. You know, we hunt, then we come back and we gather together and we enjoy that which we've 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 gotten and harvested or foraged and and that binds us together just like you and i you know should we meet someplace down the road it'll be like oh this is great and we'll just carry on it like you know and we've only spent an hour together so that's that's, where we're prepped the plate in 30 minutes came from is we understand you know families aren't getting around the table anymore they're not eating so when i was meeting sean and kevin my producers i said you know most of my place are you know, full dishes are, you know, prep the plate in 30 minutes. And so I'm like, wow, that's going to work, you know, because I'll show you how to multitask and get that on the table within 30 minutes. That way your family can sit and eat and enjoy it together. As we say, food brings families together. They all need it and they love it, right? Yeah, for eons. I mean, you're either a hunter or you're a gatherer, but then you came back to the cave and the fire. Right. And there, there's your family. I mean, right. that's your tribe. And that's what's nice about our show. It's just not about, uh, you know, meat and wild game, fish net. We do a lot of foraging, too, like mushrooms. Um, we just did an episode on wild leeks. Did you ever hear of a wild leak or a ram? You know what that is out in Colorado? I've heard, I've, I've heard of them, but I've never, I don't think I've eaten them. If I have, I've forgotten. It's like if Mother Nature let an onion and a garlic uh, get romantic. They would make this out in the, out in the wild. <laughs> it only grows in the spring. <laughs> and uh, we just did an episode on that where I... I Went to a restaurant. They showed me four different ways to preserve it. I dehydrated a couple. I made a puree. Um, the leek potato soup is phenomenal. But we do that. We do mushrooms. So we're becoming more like a natural living show, too, specializing in cooking wild game. So check it out. I mean, we enjoy what we're doing. Hopefully it comes across and you enjoy it. Um, my big thing with my show is I like to go out and meet people and have them teach me their family traditions. And I don't take credit for it. I give it to them. But, you know, if you want to share it with me, I would love to share it with everybody if it's that good. And now I think that's the only way we're going to get these traditions passed around is if we do it electronically, if you will. You know what I mean? No, I agreed. And uh, with that being said, um, Sean, you and I could continue talking, you know, uh, a long time. But uh, for the sake of your time, I'm going to say we're going to wrap the show. So give a shout out to whoever we give them shout outs to uncles and cousins and grandfathers and grandmas, the whole show, but take, take a minute or two. You got the mic and give some shout outs and then we're going to wrap the show. Great. Bruce. First of all, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. It was great talking with you. Um, if you go on the food channel, I am the premier chef for the month. So they did an interview with me. So you can go through and check that out. Uh, but I've just, you know, they're gone now. Hopefully you can hear it in heaven. But I'd like to thank my dad and my uncles and my grandfather and everybody, my mom, who's still alive. Thanks for teaching me how to cook. And uh, I became pretty good at it. And uh, just thank you, everybody. Check out our show. Let me know what you want to see. Let me know what you like. And reach out and talk to me because I will talk back. Okay, one more time. How do people get in touch with you? You can go on Facebook, which is uh, Game On, Prep the Plate in 30 Minutes. 
You can go to our website, www.gameoncooking.com. You can look uh, Game On on the Food Channel and also on Bonko TV, B-O-N-K-O TV. Search, uh, it's under the Food Cooking segment and it's Game On Cooking. We have seven uh, full episodes there, like full 20-minute episodes that you like. Yeah. Sean Bailey, thank you so much for a lot of trips down memory lane. I mean, yes, <laughs> I was I was taking some video. I was pulling up out, out of my hard drive. I'm going, oh yeah, that reminds me of this and that. And oh this. nice. Oh, it was it was fun. I mean, you know, I I went to some places I haven't been in a while, and and with people that I haven't seen, maybe. Well, I know I'll I'll see him um, later on. Well, you're with me with memories though. You're right. You brought him back to me. Last thing I'm going to say is you got to say game on like sort of Cajun style. Game on. That's how I like to say that. <laughs> so, Bruce, thank you for your time. Really appreciate it. And thank you to all your fans. And uh, it's a great thing. I appreciate it. We've got a couple of great people on next um, show, Whitetail Roundup. First, Jim Willems, president of Pope and Young. And I got my first co host, Mia Anstink, who just recently got elected to the board at Professional Outdoor Media Association. Mia's going to talk to Jim about archery hunting and Jim's love for taking all sorts of game throughout. Hey, folks, we got a new sponsor. It's called Buckwild Coffee. What's so special about Buckwild Coffee? Well, a gazillion people go to Starbucks every day and drink coffee. Well, why shouldn't Buckwild Coffee offer you light? medium, or dark roast with free shipping. All you have to do is go to whitetailrendezvous.com, go to shop, and order your coffee, and I'll ship it out for free. Hey, thanks so much for visiting Buckwild Coffee, the best brew in the West, the best brew around the campfire, the best brew in the hunting shack, the best brew anywhere. Buckwild Coffee. Get yours today. North America and Africa with a stick and a string. It's going to be a good one, folks. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt. Until next time, listen, learn, and succeed.